small but powerful group of people here that want to learn about birds. Ooh, yay. Uh, yay! Um, so I am Dale Rossellette. I'm the Vice President for Education at New Jersey Audubon. And um, my colleague here, go ahead, Alexa. I I'm Alexa Pentecon. I'm the Sanctuary Director at Lorimer Sanctuaries and Franklin Lakes at Park New Jersey Audubon. So um, we wanted to sort of give you a, a, a bit of a snapshot about this area and some of the places that you could go to see birds, some of the birds that you could see. My husband happens to be a wildlife photographer, so all of the bird photos are his bird photos. So that made it really nice and easy um, for this particular presentation. Um, maybe, yeah, we could. So I wanted to just sort of give you uh, first a little bit of this. Um, a little bit of snapshot about New Jersey Audubon. So New Jersey Audubon, um, we are one of the oldest and largest conservation organizations in the state of New Jersey. There are a number of awesome conservation organizations, land trusts all across the state of New Jersey. We are celebrating our 125th uh, anniversary this year. I have not been there for 125 years, but I've been at New Jersey Audubon since the early 80s. So have seen um, a really great growth in the organization, basically from a glorified birding club, which was essentially, you know, for, for many years, it, New Jersey Audubon was very, very, very focused only on birds and birding. Um, but now the organization does a lot more than that. So we do a lot of habitat stewardship across the state of New Jersey. Um, we are involved in uh, wildlife research, especially related to uh, bird populations hawks and shorebirds and songbirds, even uh, monarch monitoring. So we're really trying to uh, keep things uh, uh, in a state where we can actually uh, understand population swings across the state. We do a lot of nature recreation. So when we think of bird watching and birding, that's part of our recreation, but it's also you know, potentially doing kayak trips um, on the harbor in Cape May or biking tours or um, you know canoeing trips. So lots of different kinds of nature recreation that is not just uh, birding. And then um, we do a lot of environmental education. So I over oversee New Jersey Audubon's education department. So across the state of New Jersey, we're reaching you know thousands of kids every year. We're reaching tons of different people um, across the state, both in our uh, rural communities, our suburban communities, our urban communities, and really focusing in on, a lot on um, not only connecting people with their local ecosystems, but also looking at sustainability and the effects of climate change here in the state of New Jersey. So talked a little bit about sustainable and resilient communities, and then also um, environment and, and conservation advocacy. So we have um, an arm of New Jersey Audubon that's focused uh, in Trenton and also uh, in Washington on things that are very specific to uh, New Jersey and trying to make New Jersey a better place for people as well as for wildlife and habitats. So a lot going on across the state, but what we're going to be talking about today are birds. Um, so I like to start this to say, okay, so why did you come to this particular presentation? All right, I'll start with you. Oh, I don't yeah, know. why? Because um, I like birds, and I only know short birds. So. All right, so. <laughs> so I'm going to learn a little something new, although I do know I've been with white birds and robins, and that's it. <laughs> okay, perfect, and that's where we want to do. We want to start with what, what you know, right? So that's the thing. A lot of people will say, to, well, I'm not a birder, and I'm like, do you look at any bird in your backyard? Then that's a birder, a bird watcher. It's okay. What about you? What kind of seems Jen? I really want to learn more about birds. I really find myself like birds lately and go out and notice things. And I work with somebody who knows so much. So okay. I like people go out there with her. Great. Okay. Excellent. Well, first I wanted to share a little story that I, I was just down in Cape May a little while ago, uh -huh. and I saw a hike at on the, on the they actually Audubon had a hike there, a birding hike. And they were just they were walking there and taking pictures and apparently and uh, you know with you know amazing amount of shorebirds. So I said, mm -hmm. you know, I know Audubon does a lot of great stuff. And I was always curious. I mean, with the climate change going on and everything, you know, maybe the migrations of birds have changed a little bit. You know, what was here in New Jersey is now it's getting a you know a little warmer. 
you know, have the birds changed? Uh, you know, I've always been fascinated by birds. Oh, that's that's excellent. We'll we'll touch on that. And if I don't touch on it at some point, bring that question up again when we start talking a little bit more about the individual species, because there ha we have seen some changes. As I was saying earlier, we've been doing wildlife monitoring and and uh, population research for over 40 years in the state of New Jersey. So we have seen different trends of certain populations, whether it's shorebirds, seabirds off the coast of New Jersey, uh, um, their migrations are, are timing a little bit later. So there have been some trends that we've been seeing um, over the last you know, 25, 30 years. So that's why you do this population monitoring to see those trends. Okay, you. Uh, I'm a bird watcher and I wanted to see if there was any updates on the Sparta Mountain uh, restoration, as it were, habitat warblers and things like that? I personally don't have any updates on that. That's been that's been um, worked with our stewardship department and uh, DEP. So I don't know specifics about that, but there's lots of opportunity for when we're looking for warblers and we'll talk about some of the spots that we can go to to see all sorts of different kinds of birds. So, in the back there. Um, I'm a biologist and okay. I like finding new birds to have my life with. Okay, excellent. All right. I have a degree in environmental science and I like all animals and birds are really birds are one of the favorites. Okay, fantastic. Oh, I'm new to birds. Um, I don't see that well, so it's really difficult. Okay. Um, but We've been working with John Park and Kristen Hop is coming to our school in a few month weeks. Oh, excellent. What school? Uh, Alamuchi School, the Mountain Village okay, School. Okay, great. And I figured that my su the success that I've had with what they've done, that your lecture had to be just as good, if not better. Oh, okay. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, you set me up there. <laughs> Um, I spend a lot of time on local waters. Right. I see lots of birds. I okay. take a lot of pictures. Yep. Um, they're easy subjects. They're they all around. they are. So and that's you know I I that's that's a really great point. Is out of out of all wildlife. I mean birds are ubiquitous. They're all they're everywhere. You could go pretty much any place anywhere and see some birds somewhere. So, um, and, and they're just, they're really fascinating. So if we think about all the species that we have here, I'm not gonna identify all of them. Can um, I ask what the one for the one for the osprey is? Does everybody know where the osprey is? Yeah, it's in the right corner. Okay. The tree swallow. The tree swallow. Oh, it's so pretty. Yeah, yeah, tree swallow. Okay, so you want me to do it real quickly? Just <laughs> yes. Do you wanna do it? I can do some of them. Okay, you go for it. You have the oil right next to it and that foot. Um, I think the one in the left corner is an eastern bluebird. This one down here? Yes. Uh, nope. This is an indigo bunting. Indigo bunting, okay, but blue, so f perfect, okay. Um, the, that's oyster catcher. Yep, uh, yeah, uh right, right there. there. Then you have the golden finch. Yep, New Jersey state bird. Um, you have the hummingbird. Yep, ruby-throated hummingbird up here. Wood duck. Yep. Awesome. Um, chickadee next to the robin. Yep. Carolina or black capped? Black capped. Yeah, I don't know which one it is. <laughs> I was just trying to, was just trying to catch it. We have two chickadees in New Jersey. Okay. I have the one next to the oil is some sort of sparrow. Yeah. Anybody? Anybody know this one? This is what my favorite it's sparrow. Field sparrow, or it could be a fox sparrow. It's a fox sparrow. Uh, we only see them in the winter time. Yeah. Um, Anybody else want to jump in? It's a great egret, as opposed to a snow egret. Yeah, great egret. Uh, yeah. They're actually here in Hackettstown right now. Are they really? Yeah, over at Lumbine Field, and nice. they actually go back and forth. Nice, nice. Okay, so we missed um, we missed this one. I would say I do really it's well. Thrush. Thrush. It is a thrush. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a thrush of deep woods. It's a wood thrush. Okay. Deep wood. Nobody got that. Okay. <laughs> All right. We know this one, right? The American robin, the red winged blackbird. What about this one right there? Yellow warbler. No. Idea. It certainly is a yellow warbler, but it's not a yellow warbler. 
This is a southern species. It comes up into uh, Cape May County, Cumberland County, so it doesn't get up as far as here typically. A prothonotary warbler. It's one of those sought after birds, like it's like, oh, I want to see a prothonotary warbler. Okay, so do, do, do. what about this one? Cerulean warbler? Not a cerulean. What color throat is it? Black throated blue warbler. This bird is in this part of the state. This is an awesome bird to see in springtime migration. We'll talk about that a little bit. Is it in Sussex County? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. This bird is in Sussex County. That's an oven bird. Another oh, kind of. Central Jersey too. Yep, and in, and in Southern, right? So we'll talk about that a little bit. I'm not going to go to this one quite yet. We saw the osprey, the tree swallow. Another really awesome warbler is the hooded warbler. Oh. Nice name. Mm -hmm. What about this one for all you grassland people? Eastern oh, meadowlark. Yep. Yeah. And we got the indigo bunting. So this last one right there, that's also a very southern species that is a southern uh, summer tanager. So you don't typically oh, get them up yeah. in this part of the state. All right, Whew, I wasn't planning on doing that. Anyway, so um, part of the thing with birds, I think, is that people come to birds and bird watching because number one, they, they do these amazing migrations, right? We, we all know that birds migrate, but when we think about it, we have things like the ruby-throated hummingbird, only hummingbird east of the Mississippi. It migrates to Central America, right? We'll talk about a little bit more about this, but the migration patterns of these birds are really spectacular. And it's hard enough for some people to use their GPS to get from point A to point B. <laughs> these birds do it without the help of a traditional GPS. Some other things is that they have these amazing songs. So some people are brought into birds and bird watching because they, they have auditory, they can do the auditory thing. They hear things. And just listening to some of the warblers and the songbirds um, and the songs that they, they sing is just really, it's amazing. My husband has lost <laughs> the high range of his hearing and he keeps telling me he's going to get hearing aids. And I'm like, can't you hear that? And he's like, no, I can't hear that anymore. But they have such a range in their songs um, that really getting part of birding is listening. Right? It's not always about the visual, it's also about listening to these species. And then lastly, um, we also know that they're gorgeous. I mean, so sometimes people will say, oh yeah, it's a little brown job, an LBJ, <laughs> right? And, and you can't, so shorebirds can be little brown jobs. What's the difference between a you know, semi-palmated sandpiper and a leaf sandpiper? It's like, oh, really? Um, but, you know, the most of the birds have very distinct colorations, they have very distinct patterns, and you can really sort of get to know them better by learning um, not only their structure and their sound, but also these visual cues that help you, you know, get to know them, not just identify them, but get to know them a little bit better. So people come to birds and bird watching in a number of different ways. There's lots of different people. I mean, the stereotypical, um, Jane Hathaway, you know, little old lady in tennis shoes kind of thing is no longer what bird watching or birders are all about. Um, uh, people come to bird watching in lots of different ways, different ages, different backgrounds, different demographics. Um, and we found recently, and I'll show another slide about this, with the pandemic, a lot more people came to birding because you went out, you could do birding by yourself. You didn't have to be with a group. You could still enjoy nature. You could learn a lot about the areas where you lived. So there's lots of different people that come into birds and bird watching. And then a little bit, since this is talking about economy and ecotourism, I had to put a couple of graphs in here to sort of talk about birding is one of the fastest growing, if you want to call it an industry, in the wildlife watching uh, sector. So the, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service put out this, uh, this survey, it's 2016, so it's due up again for them to, to try it again. Um, and it gives some really good information about who are wildlife watchers. Um, and when you consider yourself a wildlife watcher, 
you know, what part of that segment are you actually uh, doing more of, right? So whether you are hunting, whether you're fishing, um, what your you know, age demographic is. So if we look at these, um, these graphs, most wildlife watchers are in that 45 to over 65. Why do you think that's the case? Because they have more time. They may have more time, right? They could be retired, you know, kids are out of the house maybe. What else? You may have a little more disposable income at that point in time. You might you have to travel around and yeah. stay at a hotel and go to a restaurant. Right. You might have a little bit more disposable income if you don't have kids in college, perhaps. <laughs> so, so, so that tends to be the the um, the demographics as far as age is concerned. And when we look at um, this one down here, where it says bird watchers specifically, you know, a lot of people do bird watching right around their homes, which is lovely. You know, you get to know your own patch, your own neighborhood, your own community. But then there's a lot of people that will go elsewhere, that will travel to Northwest Jersey. They'll travel to the Jersey Shore. They'll travel to Costa Rica. They'll travel to, um, you know, the western part of the U.S. to see specific birds. So there's loads of people that will go on their vacations specifically to see birds. So if you're looking at this part of the state and the, um, the uh, presentation that we were just in, sort of tying things together so it makes it easier for people to do their bird watching, to stay overnight, to find the restaurant, to go on a canoe trip or a kayak trip, to take a bike ride, you know, really trying to package those things together. And this part of the state has less of those amenities um, than other parts of the state, but it has more of the natural assets um, than some other parts of our state. So, um, here's the other one that I wanted to put in here. So in New Jersey, I mean, I was sort of blown away when I found this source. Um, 11.2 billion in outdoor recreation goods and services. It's pretty, it's, that's pretty darn substantial, right? And um, while ecotourism and tourism itself is a bigger, you know, nut as far as the, the jobs and everything, but if we're looking at outdoor recreation specifically, um, you are in that 140,000 jobs, as well as they would consider me and Alexa to be in that as well, because we work in this segment or this industry. So there's a lot going on here in New Jersey related to outdoor recreation, and then tying the birds into that um, just really uh, makes a nice complete package and product. So as I said earlier, COVID um, drew, drew a lot of folks uh, out into uh, nature for the first time. I think there was a statistic that um, like 75% of people that uh, were interviewed said that they went to one of their local parks and like 25% of them it was for the first time ever. So it, it also put a stress on those local parks, but now people know where they are. So um, trying to capture the people that came out during the pandemic and now provide them with opportunities to learn more. Um, it's a really awesome opportunity that we have right now um, across the state of New Jersey to really continue to uh, you know, encourage people to use our, our natural areas in a lot of different ways and respect them because that was the other thing that we have been talking about as well. So let's talk about New Jersey. Anybody who has bought a house, it's all about location, right? Location, location, location. And New Jersey is in an awesome location for birds and especially bird migration. So it is considered, actually we consider to be the crossroads migration. There might be some people that might argue about that in other parts of um, the country, but we're basically halfway between the Arctic and the equator. So that's the location of New Jersey itself. Um, we are a coastal state as well, and that in itself helps us with our bird diversity. Um, so when we think about New Jersey at the crossroads of migration and where it's, we're situated, there are a number of birds that have their northern limit in New Jersey. They're more southern species, 
and they get up as far as let's say Cape May County, Cumberland County, and Southern you know, Atlantic County. So things like the white ibis on the right hand side, they don't hang out in New Jersey, but in recent years, they have been moving their, um, uh, their limits to Southern New Jersey. And there, you can now regularly see the white ibis here in Southern New Jersey. And we have them in some of our heronries um, in a, an ocean city area. So that's something that's really interesting. The guy on the left is called a Swainson's warbler. They also are more of a like a Delmarva Peninsula, you know, Virginia, you know, southern species. And we have them showing up more regularly here in southern New Jersey. The other thing that's cool about New Jersey is that we are the southern limit for a number of northern species. So the bird on the left, the uh, slate colored or dark eyed junco, we see them at our feeders in the wintertime. They come down into New Jersey and further south and, and, and come readily to uh, bird feeders. But they also nest in the extreme northern parts of New Jersey. So, um, so they, they are Appalachian nesters and further up into New Hampshire and Vermont. But they do come down here into, into northern New Jersey. And then the northern goshawk is also another bird that is only found in this northern northwestern part of the state. So we're at this really cool place where there is this overlap between southern species and northern species. Does anybody have any idea how many species of birds are on New Jersey's bird list? Take a guess. Take a stab. 500. 500, OK. Else? No, wants to toss it out there. I don't know, like 1,500. 1,500? Okay, very ambitious on the <laughs> It's closer to 500. Okay. It's about 485 species. I mean, these are species. I feel like there's a lot of little LBJs out there. So. Yes, there's lots of LBJs out there. But at four, like 485 might be on our state list. This includes birds that no longer exist, like you know Carolina parakeet and heat hen and those kinds of things. Um, but that's about half of all the birds in North America have showed up in New Jersey at some time, which is, you know, we're a little state. So it's pretty phenomenal that that happens. So we are also in the Atlantic Flyway. Um, so there are four, I want to say, conceptual flyways in North America. These are not specific, you know, there's not little red light, green lights out there for birds along these flyways. So the Atlantic Flyway basically takes most of the birds that are nesting up in this area and funnels them, you know, wherever down into Central and South America. Um, so the Atlantic Flyway is, you know, it's pretty cool because again, we're a coastal state. The birds, when they are migrating, they use landforms. That's one of the things that they use when they're migrating. So they're going to use the Atlantic coastline. They're going to use the Delaware River. They're going to use the Appalachian Mountains, the Kittatinnies. So they're using these major landforms to help navigate them getting from point A to point B. So, quick question. yeah, how far out into the coast or into the ocean would you consider the Atlantic Flyway to go? It depends on the, well, so it depends on the type of bird you are, right? Okay. So um, there are seabirds that they're only going to really <laughs> migrate up and down the coast. They're not going to go up the Mississippi Flyway, which is in the center part of the country. So, I mean, it, you could be going out, you know, a hundred miles, maybe. Oh, wow. I mean, so there's there's bird watchers who will take um, a, a, what's called a pelagic trip. So they'll get on a boat and they'll go out to the Hudson Canyon, which is way out in the Atlantic, and they are looking for specific seabirds that you're not going to get to see in near shore. Mm -hmm. um, and those birds are, you know, just flying up and down, um, you know, out there in the Atlantic Ocean. So, but if you're a land bird, you don't want to be out over the ocean unless you have a specific strategy for making it that far. 
And, um, and so, you know, they want to hug the coastline as much as they possibly can. Okay, okay. so birds, when they migrate, they're looking at landforms um, and, and uh, they're using those to help orient themselves. They are also using um, all sorts of other visual cues for they're using stars. There's a lot of birds that migrate at night. So this is the thing that blew me away. I mean, I was a bird watcher for a long time and then somebody told me, oh, did you know that warblers and all other songbirds fly at night? And I'm like, what? I didn't know that. So they're using the stars, they're using the position of the moon, um, they're using the sun's position, they're using the Earth's gravitational forces to help orient them and to help them get from point A to point B. So the other night, I was sitting in my yard. So I live in Cape May, and which is right here. For those of you that are living up here, Cape May is right there. <laughs> um, and I sit out in my yard at night, and it's reasonably quiet, and I can hear bird chips as they're flying overhead. And so I sit there and I go, okay, so people that know their birds can identify the chips. I can't do that. I can just hear the chips. And the next morning, I can sit in my yard and I can see birds doing a reverse migration and they're flying over my house, headed up the Cape May Peninsula because they flew out over the ocean and they're like, oh no, I don't want to be on the ocean because I'm a little bird and if I fall in the ocean, I'm going to die. So they fly back to land and they do like this weird little reverse migration. So there's lots of fascinating things about birds that many people don't know about. So this is very, very cool. Um, this is called BirdCast. And if you want to check this out, um, it is really neat because it predicts migration. So this was for September 14th, and it shows that pretty much the eastern part of the US, because of the wind direction, because of the wind speeds, um, and because of the time of year, the people that put all the algorithms together were saying it was gonna be one really good migration night, and it was. So this is really a neat tool. So the other thing about bird watching is that there's a lot of things out there that we didn't have 20 years ago that now we can get more information and we can sort of get more involved in, in actually the, the, the migration part of things. So BirdCast is one of those things. Another thing is that we have a lot of people that are working to track birds, trying to get a better understanding of where these birds are going, you know, what is um, what is their uh, their physiology? You know, how much do they weigh? You know, what happens when you know the bird goes off course? And so, with the technology that we have nowadays, we can put very, very, very tiny little um, they're called uh, life trackers or something like that um, on even these little tiny shorebirds and sparrows and warblers. And they connect to cell, tone, cell phone towers, and we can actually see where these birds are going. So it also helps us determine what are the habitats that these birds are using. So it becomes a very powerful conservation tool because when we get enough data, we can say, oh, this particular place is being used by so many birds or they're using this particular habitat for seven or eight days during their migration. So let's focus some of our efforts on those particular habitats. If we have to manage them or preserve them or do whatever it is that we need to try to do. So there's lots of technology now that we can really use to help not only track the birds, but really get a general sense of bird populations. So if we go back to New Jersey, location, 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 right? Um, because it all goes back to geology. It all goes back to rocks. Um, I took geology at Ramapo College way back in the day. And everything is rocks. So because of the geology of New Jersey, you have these different large scale landscapes, right? So we are in um, the, you know, the highlands, Ridge and Valley section of New Jersey. We have the 
you know, the Piedmont section here, um, you know, we have the, um, uh, in the landscape regions, we have the Pinelands, which I was in on Thursday. Um, so lots of different habitats in a very small space. You can go from mountains to beach within, well, without traffic within like about two <laughs> hours. <laughs> it might be three and a half, I don't know. Um, so geology has determined these large scale landscapes. These large scale landscapes, then within those, you have tons of different habitats, the smaller habitats. And within the habitats, you have vegetation that then helps determine what kinds of birds might be there. Right, whether they're nesting in the vegetation, they're eating the seeds or the berries or whatever it ends up being. So it again, it all goes back to rocks. And habitat, you know, habitat, habitat, habitat is all what it is. Whether you're looking at marshes or woods or, um, you know, grassy areas, whether you're looking at meadows, lakes, ponds, um, you know, New Jersey has it all. And because New Jersey has it all, we also have so many birds, so many birds. Um, so focusing in now on this particular area, because I needed to put everything in context, um, there is something called the Wildlife Action Plan, which was created by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And it really looks at the various uh, parts of New Jersey. And when we're looking at this section of New Jersey, you know, look at all those different habitats, northern mixed hardwood forests, uh, pitch pine, scrub oak forests on mountaintops. You know, they're up there because there's, uh, there's poor uh, soil nutrients, um, but that creates a different set of trees that live there and um, other kinds of vegetation. We had those hemlock ravines, which are, you can't find them anywhere else in New Jersey. And they're really very specific um, to this northwestern part of the state. Grasslands, the meadows, limestone fens, floodplains, wetlands, and the largest concentration of glacial lakes in New Jersey. So, you know, when you put all that together, it's pretty spectacular. And, um, and that's why the birds are here. So here we go. We're going to take a little bit of a road trip. But before we do that, I'm going to stop. Any questions? Any thoughts? Any comments? Yes. So I noticed that a lot of the Audubon um, events are down in Cape May. And you did say that that's the northern limit for the southern birds. Mm -hmm. What is it about Cape May that draws them? So when I think about birds, I think about two things. I think about um, uh, resident birds. So, you know, the breeding species that are here. And then I think of the, um, the migratory species that pass through, right? So, um, because they're almost, it's almost like, I don't want to say two distinct populations, but it's two uh, uh, parts of the puzzle. So with um, southern New Jersey, especially in the Cape May area, one of the things that you have is you have a lot of preserved marshland and you have a lot of areas that have high concentrations of shorebirds and marsh birds. Not that this does not occur elsewhere in New Jersey. You have the shorebirds and the horseshoe crab phenomenon that happens um, on our Delaware Bay beaches every year, which is just spectacular. Um, you have the beach nesting shorebirds, things like the oyster catcher and the um, black skimmers and the piping plovers. Those occur all across the state of New Jersey, but perhaps some of the beaches in um, southern New Jersey are less populated um, than some of the beaches in northern New Jersey. So you have that. Um, and then you have that northern limit of southern species, right? You have things like summer tanager and the prothonotary warbler. Um, that people can't see anywhere else in the state of New Jersey. Um, so then during migration, what happens is that the birds are funneled with slight northwest winds. The birds are funneled to the coast and south. So, so Cape May Peninsula becomes sort of where all those birds are like 
okay, now what do we do? We don't want to fly out over the ocean. We don't want to cross the bay yet because we don't have the, re the best wind. So it tends to concentrate birds there, especially in the fall, in the fall migration. So there's just a lot of opportunity um, to see birds um, in, in that particular area. But there's tons of opportunity elsewhere across the state. So Alexa used to work in the Meadowlands. And there were lots of bird related walks and all sorts of things in the Meadowlands. There's and we're going to talk about these particular places here and when they are best uh, to to go and see birds. So great question. Yes. Also, National Wildlife Refuge is a great place. I went there this year and they saw, I think, this year totally 235 species of birds. Right, so Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge, all of our National Wildlife Refu Refuges are great. Someone was talking about the Wall Hill um, up in this area, you know, that's a great place to go bird watching um, and mostly for, um, hey. Uh, so what we're going to do, was there any other questions before I move on? So I know that the places that we're going to visit today are not the only places in this area and actually um, that map that there was a map that I took a picture of. Oh, I forget who that was. Anyway, so if if we're looking, you know, we're looking at all of this area and and you know we can cross over into Pennsylvania and New York as well. So it's not just New Jersey, but I know New Jersey best. Um, so we're talking about you know high point in Stoke State Forest. We're talking about um, uh, you know, the Delaware River Old Mine Road area, you know, which is just awesome. Um, we're going to, to visit um, uh, oh, uh, Kittatinny Ridge, where uh, Raccoon Ridge, which is great in the fall, like this time of year. Um, also, um, the Alpha or the Pahatcom Grasslands, which is a really awesome place to visit for birds. Um, and then the Merrill Creek area as well. So, as I said, these are not the only places to go to in this area. There's lots of jewels um, that you can visit. And again, we go back to you can see birds anywhere. Um, but these are uh, these are tried and true places that we typically take people. If we're going to drive to some place and we're going to bring people with us on a, you know, a bird walk or whatever, um, these are the places that we typically would go to. Okay, so we're going to start at High Point. Um, who here has been to High Point or Stoke State Forest? Okay, awesome. All right, so then you might not be able to, so you want to do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, part of the draw for this part of the state is, is just, you know, conti contiguous forests, right? So there, that's just a gorgeous area. Um, earlier, somebody said, you know, from their out of state, um, you know, well, really, you live in New Jersey and you have all these beautiful places in New Jersey. And we're like, <laughs> but I know that's not the reason why we're here today. We're trying to bring more people, but it has to be balanced. So while all of these places are good during the year, you know, I picked the ones that I thought could be seasonal. Um, so, you know, in spring and early summer, you know, the, the, these northern forests are just spectacular. So whether you are in the woods, walking, hiking, you know, kayaking, canoeing, and you hear the really amazing drumming of the pileated or pileated, however you want to say it, um, woodpecker, you know, this is our largest woodpecker in the area. It's probably the, one of the largest, it might be the largest in the country, let me think. I think it's the largest in the country. Um, you know, I, I don't get these where I live. So... They don't make it down to southern New Jersey. So anytime I can be in North Jersey and see a pileated, I'm like, yes. Um, and they're so cool because they will forage on the ground. They like to eat ants. They'll, they will just like, they will throw, yeah. uh, you know, if you've ever seen one working a dead, a dead, um, you know, stump or something. I've seen one tear apart a stump in, in about three days. Yeah, it's, ama it's amazing yeah. what they will do. Um, but they are one of our signature woodpeckers up here in this part of the state, and a lot of people want to see them. They're making a very strong comeback in Central Jersey, too. I mean, oh, excellent. You can go to Washington Crossing State Park this time of year, mm -hmm. and I almost even guarantee to see them. Okay. I see them in Mercer County Park all the time. I hear them all yes, the time. Yes, yeah. 
And there's, you know, they're spectacular. You see this thing <laughs> flying, and they're about the size of a crow, yeah, you know. And it's, yeah, and they and they do the same woodpeckery thing. They swoop. They do sort of this kind of thing. I mean, they're just they're just amazing. Anybody know this species? Red eye period? No. But good for the red eye. But this is a, that's a good spot for this this guy. The long tail. One of two that we have here in the northern america crazy another word for crazy we want to go over the idea uh, cuckoo. <laughs> right. so this is one of two cuckoo species that we get um except for the one that's down in florida so this is a black-billed cuckoo the other one is yellow-billed cuckoo uh, black-billed cuckoo and yellow-billed cuckoo can eat spiny caterpillars so they um, they can actually when they eat the spiny caterpillars, um, they can they can sort of toss up their stomach every once in a while, the stomach lining um, to get rid of all the little spiny things. It's pretty fascinating. So not only are birds beautiful and they sound great, but they have very fascinating uh, life histories. So when you get into some of these northern forests, um, cuckoos, you don't see them necessarily very often. You can hear them. If you sort of get tuned into their sound, they often will just sit in a tree. Has anybody ever seen a trogon? Like, has, has anybody been to the tropics before and seen a trogon? Like the Quetzal. Have you heard of the Quetzal, the resplendent Quetzal? Okay. I don't even know how to spell that to look it up. <laughs> trogons, trogons. Yeah, they, they sit in trees. Well, they don't have hands, so um, they don't do this. But they, they sort of, they're very slow and deliberate. Um, it's really fascinating to watch this. So if you get a chance to see a black billed or a yellow billed cuckoo, don't just say, oh, cuckoo, you know, check it off. Watch them and watch their behavior because it's really fascinating. One of the other signature birds, this is one of the ones that we saw in the, in the beginning um, of these northern forests is the wood thrush. And so we have a number of different thrush species. We have wood thrush, we have great cheek thrush, we have Swainson's thrush, we have um, Veery, we have, what's the other one I'm thinking? Hermit. Hermit thrush. So we have a number of different thrush species. Um, I don't wanna say by far the wood thrush is the most beautiful singing thrush because they all have you know, really awesome songs. But this is a song that you, it, you know, they say Eole and it's very, loop like so if you go into any of these deep forests any of these forests in northern new jersey um you know you can hear that in early spring they're setting up their territory um it's really really fun and fascinating to see them uh there they are a declining species um, lots of forest fragmentation um you know just uh, with the forest fragmentation it also um uh, allows predators in so whether there's you know foxes or raccoons or um, they are uh, they are very susceptible to brown headed cowbirds, which uh, uh, lay their eggs in the wood thrush nest. So they are definitely a declining species that we have to keep an eye on. Um, another one, and again, you have all sorts of bird watchers. There are some bird watchers that just want to go out and walk a trail and see what they can see, and then you have other bird watchers that really keep the life list that really want to go to a specific place to see a specific kind of bird. So the cerulean warbler is one of, again, one of those special birds that people really want to see because there's not a ton of them. Um, so Stokes is one of the uh, places that you can uh, see these pretty, I don't want to say easily, but you can usually, you know, in the springtime, if you know what they sound like, um, you know, you can see a cerulean warbler and typically warblers are going to be up there so you know you get what we call warbler neck because you've got your binoculars and you're looking like this for like three hours um so you know they they typically are foraging you know higher up in the trees because that's where a lot of caterpillars are okay which makes sense whereas this guy um it the oven bird and i think who said you do you know what they sound like Aren't they the ones that call for their teacher? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's great. They, I think they actually, if you look at the sound. Her teacher, teacher, teacher. Yeah, yeah, if you look at the sound cadence, it's, yeah, it doesn't say teacher, 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 but that's what it sounds like. 
and it's really loud. Yeah. And they tend to be a forest floor, so they tend to be lower down in the understory of the forest. Um, so I know that our at our own Sherman Hoffman Wildlife Sanctuary, which is in Bernardsville, uh, we have watched the forest degrade over many years, uh, you know, due to deer browse and then invasive species. Because the uh, ovenbird is a forest floor dweller, if you have no understory, you have no places for these guys to make their nests. So we have seen, you know, in our own sanctuaries, you know, just a precipitous decline in the species because the forest floor is still grass, barberry, and then tree. So, um, so we've seen that and documented that at our Sherman Hoffman Sanctuary. And these guys are awesome. And they're across the state of New Jersey. Uh, Scarlet Tanagers is one bird that is like a wow bird. Um, people will see it and go, oh. um, but it's really interesting because of the bright red and the bright green leaves. Sometimes it's really hard to actually see scarlet tanagers in the forest. Um, I don't know what it is. It's something about the way our eyes are made that the red and the green, um, you know, it, for some reason it can be very difficult to actually find these birds. Uh, the females are yellow. And that makes it even harder to find them in greenery. Um, but they are gorgeous. They are insectivorous. They migrate down to, again, Central, uh, Central America, the islands. So they make one of those magnificent migrations. And they can come back to the same space every year. Like we've had documentation because we banded some birds that they come back to literally the same general area and these birds do that without their gps without their google maps or their ways or whatever it is so it's pretty fascinating another really cool place um, up in stokes is the cruiser natural area um, so this is you know a, a, a bog you don't get bogs up here very much it's a perched um you know glacial area uh, it has Atlantic white cedar growing in it, which uh, having just been in the Pine Barrens, that's where you think of Atlantic white cedar. But you get some of that up here into this beautiful area. In the spring, it can be just filled with different kinds of warblers, whether you get the hooded warbler, um, that's the upper left. There's our black-throated blue warbler in the middle. And then what about the one on the bottom? Does anybody? It's an oriole of some sort, I think. No, but it's the same colors as the oriole. So this is a warbler. It's an American red start, and an American red start is one of um, the bird species that populations are actually um, increasing rather than decreasing. They can handle um, uh, forest edges versus deep forest. So uh, the last couple of migration nights and days that I've had um, have been predominantly um, uh, young uh, American red starts which has been really fun to see. So that's our Halloween bird. It can be our mascot for your Halloween trail at Laura <laughs> Sanctuary. <laughs> Another thing that we can see at this bog area is, uh, does anybody see the bird? So ruffed grouse, again, a declining species in New Jersey. Um, they, uh, they have very specific requirements. You know, they like deep, dark forests, just like the Northern goshawk. Um, so uh, really thinking about, you know, what can we do to help uh, create situations where these birds, these populations can increase um, would be fantastic. I want to do a time check. How are we doing there? Uh, we about 20 seconds. Okay, perfect. All right. Okay. Um, another thing that you can find up in that whole area, that's, that Stokes High Point area, are um, beaver blood plains, right? So um, beavers are very industrious. Um, and they create situations where you get these uh, flooded areas, flooded wetlands, um, where you have this great uh, overlap between sort of um, wetlands areas, uh, 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 field areas, and then uh, edges of forests. So when you have sort of those eco, what call, are called ecotones, um, that can increase the number of species that you might actually see there because you have certain species that are using those individual 
uh, spaces, but then you have overlap. You have like, you know, woodland birds that are coming out to the edge looking for caterpillars. You've got, so it's, it's a really cool thing to look for sort of these uh, overlaps and ecotones. This yellow warbler is, is one of the birds that you'll see um, in these sort of more um, field edges and wetland edges. And then you see them along the Delaware all over the place. Um, also, uh, eastern kingbirds. So eastern kingbirds, um, uh, kingbirds are fly catchers. So they need open perches to sit on because they will actually, what's called, they will sally up and grab insects out of the air. Um, the Eastern Kingbird's Latin name, I know like two Latin names. This one is Tyrannus Tyrannus. So what does that tell you about this bird? Ferocious. They are ferocious. They are very territorial. They will attack low-flying planes. They, I mean, they, they, I mean, they will they will ride the back of a you know a red-tailed hawk or a bald eagle or because their territory is their territory and they do not want anybody in What's their territory. What's common name again? Eastern kingbird. Oh they're, yeah, yeah. They're about yeah. this big. I've seen them. They're gorgeous. You know, um, they've got that white sort of slash across the end of the tail that's very easy to see in flight. And they, they make a sound like, like a kitter, 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 kitter. So it, they're really fun. They come back early in the spring. So it's really nice to see them when they come back. Um, this one, Baltimore Oriole. They also prefer these sort of ecotones because most of the time the Baltimore Oriole will make its nest overhanging sort of an open area. So whether it's going over like a little stream or just an open field. Um, so that's something that you can look for in the Orioles. They weave their nests, they're like pendulum nests, um, and it's, they're just gorgeous. And you think that a bird can actually do that without hands. It's amazing. We try to have kids create a nest. <laughs> you just can't do it. I mean, these, 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 these birds are just amazing in what they're able to do. So we're going to move on to the Delaware Water Gap, the National Recreation Area, Old Mine Road. Again, this you, you can visit this any time of the year, obviously, uh, but spring and early summer, it's alive with bird song, which is really, that's really fun. If you get to some of these places early enough in the morning, you'll hear what's called the dawn chorus. So that's the, all the birds are like, they are just, you know, waking up, they're singing, they're contacting each other, they're establishing their territories. And it can be really raucous and it can be really exciting to hear. And if you're an auditory person trying to sort of pull the different bird songs out um, to say, OK, there's the oven bird. Oh, there's the yellow warbler. You know, there's the oriole. There's the scarlet tanager. Um, so and, and what we do with our bird walks is we try to you know, get people on these different birds so that they can hear them and start to learn um, them that way as well. So I would say that one of the signature birds for the Delaware River has to be the bald eagle. Um, you know, back when I started bird watching, there was one nesting pair of bald eagles in the state of New Jersey in Cumberland County. Um, so that is not the case anymore. I think there's over 200 nesting pairs of, of um, bald eagles in the state of New Jersey. You almost, if you if you do the Delaware River you're almost likely to see at least one, maybe more. Um, so it's just really fun to, to really be able to see these birds, see the comeback that they've had over the last 30 years. And the Delaware River is one of the best places um, to see them still. So uh, that's really a, a great uh, tribute to all the conservation work that a number of organizations have done. These guys? The ducks. Yeah, they're they're so amazing. These are mergansers, common mergansers, um, also called uh, sawbills because they have little tiny, um, not teeth, but it's almost like a you know saw um, on their on their bill, so that when they grab a fish, when they go under and they grab a fish, the fish can't get away. So um, they nest here. Uh, you can see them on the river if you do a kayaking or canoe trip. Um, you can see the little babies, you know, in the summertime. Um, really cool birds. 
in the um, late fall, they mass uh, in great quantities in some of the larger lakes. Um, so that's really neat to see as well. And you'll see a picture of these guys later on in the talk as well. Are they related to the hooded merganser? Are they what? Are they related to the hooded merganser? Yes, they are. So there's common mergansers, red-breasted mergansers, and hooded mergansers. Yeah, I've never seen that one. I've seen the hooded before. And the hoodeds are amazing. Yeah, black and white. Yeah, they're just so fun. And the females... They have a big head. Yeah, they do. <laughs> The females, um, I actually sort of like the females better than the males in the merganser um, group because they, they, you know, they got this thing going on. Oh, with, yeah, it's it's like either it's a nice hairdo or it's a bad hair day. Wanted however you want to perceive it. Um, so uh, so yes, I'm sure you've seen the common mergansers a lot on the river because yeah. and to see their little babies and they run on the uh, run, run on top. So many of them. Yes. Like 20 yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, crazy. Yes. Yeah. I, they might be one of the species. They they kind of watch everything. Yeah. Others. Yeah. That they do some kind of you know communal <laughs> daycare. Yeah. Communal <laughs> daycare. Perfect. Right. Um, another bird that I have seen a lot on the river when I've done some um, canoeing are um, late season flocks of these guys. So. Anybody have binoculars that you can see? <laughs> They're cedar wax wings. They are cedar wax wings. Cedar wax wings uh, are very, very cool species, mm -hmm. right? They look like they just got out of the, they just quaffed yeah. themselves. Um, this is an adult um, on the right, but you'll get these like loose groups of cedar wax wings over the water. And, you know, they are berry eaters, right? They'll, be, they'll do insects when it's, when they're nesting. They're sort of a late nester, so it's just really neat to see them over the river pretty much all season long. Um, and they, you can get these large flocks of them as well. Uh, so that's a really cool species that you see along the river. Do the male and female come in different colors? No, they don't. They look the same. Let me just go back. But in this picture right here, there's only one, I think there's only one adult right here. Uh, the youngsters are have vertical streaking on their chests and they don't necessarily have the little pointy thing, you know, fully formed yet. Um, so it might look like a different species if you saw them sitting up in the tree, but they have a very, very high pitched, very thin, wispy. It's, it's, I can't do it, but it's a really high pitched, wispy uh, song that you can hear. And if we go to, whoops, no, that's, oh, no, don't go backwards, go forward, please. And then, again, adjacent to this whole area, you have these beautiful feeder uh, streams, um, you know, lots of tributaries coming into the Delaware itself. And each one of these, depending on the kind of water that's coming in, whether it's fast water, whether it's slow water, um, you're going to get different species. So you get to where these fast water streams are, where these waterfalls are. Um, some of the species that you might see, uh, the Kentucky warbler on the upper left is another one of those species that people really want to see. And because there's not a lot of them here in New Jersey, and this is one of the areas that you can see them. In the middle, a Louisiana water thrush. Uh, they make their nests under roots on the sides of fast flowing streams. Um, and then on the bottom, the black and white warbler is the one that sort of acts like a, uh, a nuthatch. You know, they, they don't flit from, you know, uh, branch to branch the way other warblers do. They climb up and down uh, tree limbs. Um, and many of these, the Kentucky warbler and the Louisiana water thrush, because they are living and breeding in areas that have fast flowing water, their songs are very loud and they're very piercing so that, you know, they can hear their neighbors, right? They can, uh, they can, um, they can attract a mate. Uh, so um, if you ever get into these situations, you might hear some like really high pitched, very piercing uh, sounds. And it's gonna be one of these types of species. Another bird that you might find. Wait a second. Can't anybody go? Ooh. 
<laughs> I cut this bird out. Come on. Do you see the one flying in the infrared? Yeah, cool. <laughs> so, um, you know, we have a number of different owl species in here. We have great horned owls. We have screech owls. We have barred owls. Um, barred owls are usually associated with water. You know, they like to eat, you know, frogs and snakes and, you know, those kinds of things. So in some of our denser forested air, wetland forested areas, you can find, you know, small populations of barred owls. Um, it's one of our only owls that has dark, the dark eyes. Um, so really just a fun, fun, I would like to imitate it. I cannot imitate it well. Some people say it says who, who, who cooks for you all. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I try to do it, you would probably walk out and then I wouldn't have, <laughs> right? It's a competition now. You know, lakes, ponds, you know, all those glacial, um, you know, little depressions that now um, have water in them, whether it's breeding wood duck on the top, great blue herons. You know, I don't want to say there are a dime a dozen, but, you know, it, in season, it's hard not to go to a water body and see a great blue heron. Um, and then flickers also, um, common flicker, yellow shafted flicker, whichever you, I don't know what the current name of this bird is. Um, I've seen it turn around a couple of times, um, but they, you know, you look at that and you see this bird with yellow underwings flying by. It's got the big white patch over its, um, over its tail. So it's pretty easy to identify in flight. Um, they, uh, they are also a declining, um, not, I don't want to say declining species, but a species of some concern, um, because, uh, you know, they, again, if you, you know, if you lose certain aspects of their habitat, um, it makes it more difficult for them to find the dead trees that they need. Um, maybe with the ash trees, maybe we'll see it, you know, you know, just never know how, um, species are going to respond to these different environmental, um, uh, challenges, but uh, flickers are really an awesome species. I see a lot of those in the watershed here. Do you? Okay, that's great. Um, I know in some areas of New Jersey, they they um, were being bullied, just like the um, red-headed woodpeckers, by starlings. Um, so starlings sort of taking over their nap. The you know the the woodpecker would go ahead and make the hole. And then the starling would be like, okay, thanks. And it would sort of be more aggressive and drive them out. Um, so lots of fields. Again, now we're Old Mine Road area, which is a really great road, not only for the historic significance, but also because of the habitats, the preservation, um, and hopefully some active you know, management of some of these open fields. Whether you hear the fire, fire, where, where, here, here of the indigo bunting, um, that's a male indigo bunting are state birds, um, also a late season nester. They rely on thistle going to sea uh, so that they get the down of the thistle to line their nests. So they're also out and about. Um, and then this one, anybody know this one? It's not oil, is it? Because I know there's like three different species of no, oil. No, no. Look at the, look at the, um, the type of bill. Is it an eastern toki? It is an eastern toki. Yep, sometimes called rufous sided toki. Again, a bird that's gone through a couple of name changes, but the birds don't care about their name changes. It's only us. Um, so rufous sided, eastern toki, uh, you know, they are found in sort of scrubby edge areas. Um, you know, and if you if you uh, uh, if you hear them or you pish or you go sh -sh 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 kind of thing, they might pop up onto a, a branch so that you can see them a little bit better. Um, the toeys you know, drink your tea, toki. Yeah. You, know, you probably heard that at some point. That's the bird be behind that. So we give you a warning. Ten minutes. Okay, cool. Ten minutes. That's it. <laughs> okay, the uh, grasslands area. Um, so we wanted to start with this beautiful bird. So we have the um, eastern meadowlark. Again, I talked about that earlier. The song is amazing. Um, this is an area where if you really want to see grasslands and what grasslands could look like in New Jersey. Um, unfortunately, I think it's 78 that goes right through the middle of them now, which, are, you know, but, um, you know, really just uh, an amazing um, area for New Jersey to see some of these birds like eastern bluebird. Right? There's bluebird trails 
all over the state and a bluebird trails where there's you know bluebird houses and people monitor them um, but uh, eastern bluebirds will use natural cavities so they're a cavity nesting bird um, they they go into old woodpecker holes they go into houses they uh, not our houses but bird houses um, so there's lots of different opportunities to see eastern bluebirds also this one that happens to be one of my favorites bobolink. yep this is the bobolink and you will not see them looking like this this time of year um, in the middle of the summer they start molting their uh, their beautiful this is the male molting their feathers so all bobolinks this time of year pretty much look like um, uh, little brown chops uh, but they still have that sort of tinkly, um, bubbly uh, sound to them. And I mean, I can stand out again in my yard and I can hear flocks of bobolinks flying overhead, like really high up because they have a very, very distinctive little, uh, you know, tinkly, tinkly, tinkly noise. Um, so this is one of the reasons why when we are working with farmers um, that we ask them to not hay their fields until later in July, maybe if possible, even until early August, because if you hay a field that has bobolinks in it, you're going to hay the bobolinks. Um, so, you know, really sort of trying to work with people to say, hey, if you want to hay very early in the season before they arrive, and then after the nesting season is over, that's the ideal situation. Um, this guy is a uh, um, great crested flycatcher. Again, an edge species. Another uh, we talked about the eastern kingbird is a flycatcher. Um, they also will, you know, sort of like sally out, grab bugs, and then go back to their perch. So they're, once you see them, they're pretty easy to uh, to follow and to really get your binoculars on them to watch them. And then this one is pretty common in our suburban sort of interface. Um, between some of these areas. This is a, um, a great cat bird. Yes. These are one of my favorites because of their attitude. Oh, I mean, yeah. I know they're they common do. in the area, but I work in the river and they just hang out there and scream at you and talk to you. And yeah. They don't fly away like other birds. Yeah, so they're they hang like, out ah! and do the business. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and cat birds are great. Um, they, they need, you know, thick shrubbery. Uh, just like mockingbirds and thrashers need like thick shrubbery. So that's why it's important for us to also think about those edges again, you know, let these brambles grow up. Um, and uh, and they really do, I like that, they do have attitude. Their tail feathers are really cool because when they flick their tail, mm -hmm. it's like a, a brown color, like a rust color. Oh yeah, I mean, you can almost yeah. just see it right yeah. here. There's that rust right under under the um, the tail there called the vent area and uh, and they will they'll sit there and they'll go yeah. and when they the, feathers, the, they yeah. the tail feathers out it's just amazing yeah. I'm trying to get a picture of that for Kevin Quick okay <laughs> and some people go to these grassland areas for the sort of the trifecta of little brown jobs um, so you know this one is pretty uh, um, uh, common uh, this is uh, the chipping sparrow. This is a grasshopper sparrow, that's a savanna sparrow. If you are working on your birding list, if you're working to really um, you know, learn your sparrows, the grassland areas are great to go and do some really good um, you know, uh, trial, and, and trial and error because they can be difficult. But if you get them in spring and early summer, they're singing, and so that you can sort of you know, put those two things together. We might also get things like um, the beautiful barn swallow over those areas. They're insectivorous, but flying over low, they're, they're um, uh, grabbing any insects that they possibly can. All right, so we're gonna do Raccoon Ridge in the Kitty Titty Mountains. Has anybody ever been to Raccoon Ridge? It's on the Appalachian Trail. No? Awesome fall place, because what did I say earlier about migrating birds? What do they use? The flyway. Okay, they're in the flyway. Large land masses. Large land forms. So the Kittatinny Ridge, right, is a fantastic place to go hawk watching. And so there's a number of different places in New Jersey. Merrill Creek has yeah, the Scotts Mountain. Yeah, uh, it's Scotts Mountain, right? 
I call it the IO Tower. I don't know. If it's oh, okay. Also called Scotts Mountain. I think it's called Scotts Mountain. Mm -hmm. um, and then Raccoon Ridge is one. Sunrise Mountain. Uh, some people have done hawk watching from up in Stoke State Forest. Then there's the Montclair Hawk Watch in Montclair. And then there's a couple of others that are smattered around. And then, of course, K May, because again, that funneling kind of situation causes the birds to gather around. Um, so when we think about this time of year, we think about migrating birds. So this is a picture of bird migration, hawk migration at, uh, uh, you know, at one of these lookouts. Um, so what's happening is as um, the air warms up, it's creating a thermal and the birds are looking for and feeling for these thermals. So they don't want to expend much energy. They want to expend the least amount of energy that they can to get from point A to point B. So you will actually have birds that will you know, start circling and circling and circling because the, um, it's uh, warm coming off like the mountaintop. Uh, sometimes I see uh, birds circling over my driveway because it's blacktop. And so it's warming up before any of the air around it. And so as they circle and circle and circle, they get to the top of the thermal and then they will stream off in a southwesterly direction. And if you are a hawk watch counter, you watch the birds thermal, you start counting them when they're starting to stream off so that you can get an accurate count of them. So all of these birds are broadwing hawks and broadwing hawks migration is happening like right now. So if we get the right winds and you go to the top of a mountain somewhere in New Jersey, you're going to see broadwing hawks and they nest in northwestern New Jersey as well. So really cool thing. Okay. We're going to go through this. This is a kestrel, an American kestrel, one of my favorite birds. It's a falcon. It's the original fast food. They grab um, dragonflies out of the air. They just pluck their wings off and start eating the dragonfly while they're flying. This is what they look like when they turn and actually look at you. So it's just a fabulous bird. And every once in a while, you will see one of these guys zip by one of these hawk watches. Um, when you think about, and we talked about it earlier, um, when you think about a uh, ruby throated hummingbird making a 1,200 mile round trip migration and and they weigh about as much as a nickel i mean talk about inspiring right it's just absolutely incredible so we're going to end after that one no no we're not going to do three more because i have one image that absolutely gorgeous okay this is another falcon this is a merlin sometimes called a blue jack and uh, these are very powerful and you will see them along the ridges as well. They like to travel on northeast winds. So you get northeast winds, you'll see um, Merlins. This one probably many of you recognize because of the color of the tail, <clears throat> a red-tailed hawk. They like open areas. They like to circle and soar. This one you will see later in the season because it's not that common. This is a golden eagle. Um, so we do get golden eagles in addition to bald eagles, uh, only in migration for this one. This one, sometimes called the gray ghost, a northern harrier. Um, they're a very floppy flyer. So you can really see them. The ones that fly low over like yes. water, right? Yeah, so over marshes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And they'll go over marshes, but when they're flying down a ridge, they have very, very long wings, and they sort of flick their wings up at the end. As you can really, you can tell them from a really long ways away. The hawk watchers can. And this is going to be the last. I swear, it's going to. I've got like thirty thousand more slides to show you. Okay. Um, so, the Raccoon Ridge, when we did the, the hawk watch up there, you know, you start around September 1st, you go to mid-November, and, um, you know, you see this bird, like, way out, and you see it coming towards you, right, and you blink. This is another one of my cutouts, obviously. And this one, that's not real. I put that guy on top of there, and you blink, 
And the next thing you see is this <laughs> kind of like right at you. Um, peregrine falcons will come right down the ridge as well. Um, and it's really magnificent. Again, they are one of the success stories like bald eagles, like ospreys that were on the brink of um, extinction, you know, back in the day because of DDT. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good story, right? There's lots of peregrines, lots of bald eagles, lots of osprey around now. So that is just a smattering of what you could see here in northwestern New Jersey. Um, there's, remember, there's 400 and, I don't know, 85 species in New Jersey itself. So this was just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. Um, and there's lots of opportunity to bring here, people here, or if you are already working in the area, to actually um, uh, provide your constituents or the people that are already coming to your programs with some basic bird knowledge, or you know, so it's it's pretty easy to do that. So, uh, so yeah, that's it. We're good on time. Only one person left, so you beat me on that. <laughs> so, um, any questions? I grew up in Philly, and yes. also, I'm going to jump. We used to call these um, pigeon hawks. Yes. Because they would occasionally dive on a pigeon and it was longer. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I mean, they, they do. Yeah, they so do. They lived in the, the tall skyscrapers and they would just like, yep. escape nests. And yep. They yep. would just come out of nowhere. It was like, oh my God. Right. I mean, they, 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 Okay, scientists, you know, people that study peregrine falcons, you know, this is one of the fastest um, birds in a stoop, can go up to 180 miles an hour. So you got to think about how, what is the structure of this bird that can do something like that. They're amazing. Does Audubon work with other countries to help conserve their bird species? Because there's a lot of good bird species in Costa Rica mm -hmm. and Central America because you have the rainforest. Yes, so um, so I'll let me just go back. So New Jersey Audubon is separate from National Audubon. So we are a statewide organization. But yes, we are working with um, organizations in uh, Europe, in Canada, and in South America. So um, we work through our Cape May Bird Observatory with other bird observatories across the globe just to you know share population numbers, trends, all of that kind of thing. Our, um, our VP for research and monitoring, he is one of the foremost shorebird experts on semi-palmated sandpipers um, in the world. And uh, he and his team go down to Brazil, uh, to also you know, uh, Guyana and um, Suriname to study shorebirds on their wintering grounds. And, and one of the things they're trying to do is to educate um, local people not to hunt the shorebirds. So once those shorebirds get out of the U.S., they don't have the same kinds of protections um, that they have here. So yes, we do work with other organizations. So great question. Thank you for asking that. Oh. All right. All right. I guess it's break and lunch. So I do not want to be the person that stands between you and lunch. <laughs> thank so thank you, you all very much. much.